Hello and welcome back to Amcot. If you are following our full playlist, then you will be having a good grip on Spark. But upcoming few lectures will be truly focused on how we can optimize your Spark application. So without further any ado, let's get into it. Okay, so let's get started with optimizing and tuning our Spark applications. It is a very important topic to discuss because anyone can write the code, but making the code more scalable and optimize that application to handle petabytes of data is very important in the big data world. So far we have learned how to write a PySpark code and also integrate it with the external services. Where we have seen like integrating Spark with NoSQL databases like MongoDB and Cassandra. But now let's get real and we'll see how we can handle Spark applications at the production level. And we will see some optimization techniques like the tweaking the Spark configuration as well as using the cache and persist and so on. So this lecture is totally focused on how we can view and set our Spark configuration. And there are so many ways to do so. So let's jump into it. So the first aim of optimizing your Spark application is like the viewing and setting up the Spark configurations. So there are basically three ways to do that. And here we have listed down that. The first one is we have to set the configuration files. So in your Spark installation, as we have installed our Spark on a local system, we will be having different configuration files. So in the conf folder, we will be having like spark defaults.conf.template as well as we'll be having like the properties.template as well as the env, which is environment.sh.templates. So we, we can use those templates for changing the default values in these files. And we can save them without mentioning the dot template suffix. So that means that we will instruct Spark for using these new values, which you have given in those files. So you can just hit back to your Spark installation. Okay, so as you can see in my Spark installation, I have this folder and in folder you will be having the conf file. So in the conf, you can have this log4j dot properties templates as well as the matrix properties as well as the default.conf template. So all these files are like the template and we can just go into them and check our Spark configuration and tweak them to your own application. So if you can just open this. Yeah, so I have opened it in notepad. So here you can refer the master, event lock enabler, serializer, driver memory. So all these configuration are set to default, but surely we can have the more optimal configuration to your own applications. And these are like depends on every application. So whatever I'll tell you that may not feasible or I can say inappropriate for your application. So you have to just dig a little deeper about all this configuration to get a better understanding so that you can choose which one would be better for your application. So let's head back to the different ways of how we can change those. So that was the first way. But just one thing to make sure that once you are done with your configuration, you just have to remove the dot template so that it will instruct Spark to use the property which you have provided in this file. So that will be very important. So that was like the first way through setting the configuration to the conf files. But now the second way is specifying the configuration directly in our Spark application or you can use the command line while submitting the Spark application. So I have already told you that the spark submit command will be used for submitting your spark application through the command line and in the command line we can use the conf so as you can see we have given in this figure we have like the spark submit command and the conf argument where you can pass all your configurations so we have used the shuffle partition as phi as well as the executor memory to 2g as well as we have provided some jar of files. So this is how you can provide different properties while submitting your Spark application. And also we can directly submit it in your Spark application as well. So this is like a Scala function for creating a Spark session. So as you can see here in the Spark session in builder method, we have used the config for passing out all these parameters. So like the shuffle partition as well as the executor memory and so on. So you can do all this stuff through command line as well as in your application as well. And there is also one last option is through programmatic interface via the Spark shell. So you can also pass it through the Spark shell. It is not the more feasible way, but you can do that. So among all these ways which we have discussed for setting up the properties, there is an order of precedence which determines which values are honored. 
so that is very important so you have to have a clear understanding of it so any values or the flags which are defined in the configuration files will be read first followed by those on the command line with a spark submit so this means that whatever we have used in the config file will be read first and whatever else you have provided in the spark submit that will be read after that and finally those set with the spark session in the spark application so that will be your last precedence order so all these properties will be merged and with any duplicate properties reset in the spark application will take the precedence so likewise values supplied on the command line will supersede the setting in the configuration file so tweaking the right configuration will help the performance and we are going to see it in the upcoming topic but the recommendation here is choosing the right configuration for your application now we will see how to scale your spark application for a large workloads this is very important when you are dealing with petabytes of data so the large spark workloads are often like the bad jobs bad job means it will be like a delta load from source to target so some might run on the nightly basis while some will be scheduled at a regular intervals during the day it totally depends on what operations you are doing on top of your data how valuable are they to the end users as well as the amount of data you are handling so in either cases these jobs will process tens of terabytes of data or more and to avoid job failures due to like resource starvation or like a gradual performance degrade there are some of the spark configuration which we can enable or alter which can help to succeed all this job and not face any issues so this configurations will affect three spark components the first one will be the spark driver then the executor and the shuffle service running on the executors so you have to be very careful while altering or changing those configuration so the spark's driver's responsibility is to coordinate with the cluster manager for launching the executors in your cluster and also schedule the spark task on them and there are some few configurations we can tweak or enable for optimizing your resource allocation as well as the parallelizing task and avoid the bottlenecks for large number of tasks so some of the optimization ideas and insights have been derived from the big data companies like facebook which uses spark at terabyte scale and have shared this with the spark community so the first thing is static versus the dynamic resource allocation so when you specify like compute resources as a command line argument in your spark submit command which i have just seen earlier we will cap the limit this means that if more resources will be needed later at the task will queue up in the driver due to larger than anticipated workload so spark cannot accommodate or allocate the extra resources so instead you use the sparks dynamic resource allocation configurator in which the spark driver can request more or fewer compute resources as the demand of large workloads so in this scenarios where your spark workloads are dynamic that is it will vary in the demand for compute capacity and using this dynamic allocation will help you accommodate the sudden peaks in your application so one use case where this can be very helpful is like a streaming where the data flows in volumes may be uneven so if you have like the application of online store which is generating huge amounts of transactions and you want to analyze them in real time then there are some peak periods during the sell where it will need more resources than ever so that time this dynamic resource allocation will help you to avoid the queuing of job and spark will able to provide the resources for every task so for enabling and configuring this dynamic allocation we can use the setting like the spark dot dynamic allocation dot enable dot true so this property we can set to enable this dynamic resource allocation but you have to remember that the appropriate setting will totally depend on the nature of your workload and that they should be adjusted accordingly so this was one way for handling the large workloads the second one is configuring spark executor's memory and the shuffle service this is also very important so because simply enabling dynamic resource allocation is not sufficient you also have to understand how this executor memory is laid out and used by spark 
so that the executors are not starved of memory. So the amount of memory available to each executor is totally controlled by the property named spark.executor.memory. And this is divided into three sections as given in this figure here. The execution memory, the storage memory and the reserve memory. So the default division is 60% for the execution memory and the 40% for the storage and the remaining 300 MBs is for the reserve memory to safeguard against the errors. So the official Spark documentation will advise that it will only work with most cases. But you can adjust what fraction of executor memory you want to use as a baseline. So when the storage memory is not being used, Spark can acquire it for use for execution purposes and it will work as vice versa. So execution memory is used for the spark shuffles as well as the joins, the sort operations as well as the aggregations. So these are pretty shuffling operations because it will shuffle the data into the partitions because if you are joining or the sorting out the data or doing some aggregation operations, the spark has to shuffle it to able to execute the process. And since Free different queries will require different amounts of memory. The fraction of the available memory to dedicate can be tricky part, but it's easy to adjust. And to let you know that storage memory is like the primary use for caching users data and the partitions which are derived from the data frame. So what is caching that we are going to see in our next lecture of optimizing Spark workloads. And also during the map and shuffle operations, Spark writes and reads the data from local disk files. So there is a heavy input and output activity and this can result in a bottleneck because the default configurations are suboptimal for large scale Spark jobs. So knowing what configurations to tweak can very mitigate this risk during the phase of your Spark job. But there are some recommended configurations we can adjust, but these are not like the ideal configurations and these can be vary depending upon the nature of your workloads. So let's look into that now. So these are like the configurations and the default value as well as the recommendation provided by the Spark. So the first one is the Spark driver memory. So default is like the one gigs of memory and this is the amount of memory which is allocated for Spark driver for receiving data from the executors. And this is often changed during the Spark submit with the driver memory parameter. So you have to only change this if you want to expect the driver for receiving large amounts of data back from the operations. And these operations can be like the collect operation or you can also change this if you are running out of the memory. The next one is like the spark.shuffle.file buffer. So the basic will be 32 KBs but the recommended is like the 1 MB. This will allow Spark to do more buffering before writing the final map result to the disk. The next one is like the file transfer. So default will be the true but setting it to false will enforce Spark for using the file buffer before finally writing to the disk and this will decrease the input and output activity to a certain extent. So that also will set to false. The next one will be the shuffle.unsafe.file.output.buffer. So this is also default to 32 kilobytes and this controls amount of buffering which is possible when merging the files before shuffle operation. So for large values, the more appropriate for large workloads, whereas the default can work for smaller workloads as well. So it totally depends on the volume of data you are utilizing in your Spark application. And there are some similar configurations. So I'll be giving you all this in the description below so that you can go through it and optimize your Spark workloads. I'll be also giving you the Git link of these resources so that you can go through it and it will definitely help you to optimize the Spark application to a greater extent. But if you are not handling like the big data, then don't worry. But in the real world or if you are working with the production data with gigabytes of petabytes of data coming in daily, then you have to definitely go through it and then choose the right configuration for your application. And there is also one next aspect for tweaking the Spark configuration that we are going to see now. So the final aspect will be maximizing the Spark parallelism. So most of the Spark's efficiency is due to its ability to run multiple tasks parallelly at a scale. So to understand how to maximize the parallelism that is like the read and the process as much as data in the parallel as possible. 
so we have to look into how spark reads the data into memory from the storage and what partition mean to spark that is very important topic i think we have already discussed it a little bit in our introductory lectures but let's a refresh because why not it's a very important topic because most of the efficiency will come through the parallelism itself so let's talk about the partition first so a partition is nothing but a way for arranging data into a subset and there are like the readable chunk or a block of contiguous data on the disk so this subset of data can be read process independently and in the parallel as well so this independence matters because it allows for massive parallelism of the data processing so spark is very efficient at processing its task in parallel and we have also learned how it does in the previous lectures as well but for the large workloads a spark job will have many stages and within each stages there will be numerous task and spark will at best to schedule a thread per task at the core and each task will process a distinct partition so to optimizing this resource utilization and maximize the parallelism the ideal is at least as many partition as there are cores and the executors this is very important so as shown in this figure if there are more partition than there are the cores as well as on each executors then all the cores are kept busy so as we have seen earlier that spark's task processes the data as the partitions read from the disk into the memory so data on the disk is laid out in the chunks and depending upon the store but by default this file block on the data storage range in the size from all the way to 64 mb to the 128 mb for example like sdfs as well as the s3 buckets the default size is 128 mb but a contiguous collection of these blocks constitutes a partition so the size of partition in spark is dictated by a property which is called as spark.sql.files.max partition bytes so the default value for it will be the 128 mb but you can decrease the size but that may result in what's known as a small file problem this is a well known problem in the big data community so this means that many small partition files which will introduce like a inordinate amount of disk input output and the performance degradation because of the file system operation like the closing opening and the listing directories which on the distributed file system can be very very slow so partitions are also created when you explicitly use the certain methods on top of the data frame so for example while creating a large data frame or reading a large file from the disk you can explicitly instruct spark for creating certain number of partition this is very important to optimize your spark application but there are some techniques like caching and persisting of your data frame that may help optimize spark further and it spark will run your application more efficiently than ever so that we are going to see in the next lecture i hope you like this lecture so please subscribe to our channel and also ring the notification bell to get the latest updates and don't forget to follow us on our social media which i have linked in the description below thanks for watching